So one of the things that um, I've tried to argue, and I know that it, people around the room here um, are seeing that when they work with kids uh, and older children, is that the human brain is um, organized for the rapid absorption of information from social others. And the way I embody that in my research is to look at imitation and the astounding ability that young kids before language, before there's any linguistic communication, the ability they have to pick up the information they see performed by social others and have their body entrained or what we say imitate what they see other people do. And one of the things that came up in this conference and Alan's talk, uh, and both Alan's talk, is the role of emotions and its importance and issues of self-regulation. Betty Rapicoli at the University of I. Uh, Washington and I did a study where we looked at babies' ability to self-regulate and how they handled emotions in an imitative setting, in an interesting study, and I want to just set it up for you. Most of the work that we have previously done on imitation was in a dyad where the baby and the adult interacted directly, as you saw people across the table doing gestures the baby copied. But in the real world, of course, if uh, you watch third parties interact and can learn a lot from watching the social interaction of others as if you're doing emotional eavesdropping of what's happening in that relationship. So we set up an experiment to test this idea of emotional eavesdropping and what we did is had, a, um, had an adult use a tool, a stick, and show the 18 month old that if you use this stick you could push a button and it would make sound. And we know from, from uh, other laboratory experiments, if you then gave the baby the tool, the baby would jump on it and want to make, use that tool to make the sound. But we did a very special thing. We had another person that we call an emoter come in the room named Nina, and Nina watched the first adult use this tool to make the sound, and then Nina got very angry at the adult for doing it as if it was a forbidden action in this culture, as if it's putting your hand in an electric socket. <laughs> The adult got angry at the other adult, and the little 18-month-old watched wide-eyed as that happened. And I want to show you how that negative emotion affects learning and imitation. I and many other people around the world are looking at gaze following as something like the primitive roots of perspective taking, where quite literally when somebody turns to look at an object, the baby wants to take the same perspective as you do as an adult. And as I said, many people are looking at this, but we've done some uh, studies I just want to briefly mention. In our laboratory, the way it takes place is that we have two ina inanimate objects on either side of the room at a, at a distance from the baby. This is a 12-month-old sitting there across from Rochelle Brooks. She makes eye contact and then randomly, because it's an experiment, turns to one side or another. Here's the 12-month-old watching her head turn, and then the little baby, as if attached with a bungee cord, turns to the same object the adult does. The adult can look to the left, and the baby will look over there. The, baby looks, the adult looks to the right, and the baby looks there. The baby follows the line of regard without any linguistic instruction, which is important in our paradigm. The adult doesn't say anything, doesn't say, oh, wow, look at that. Use no linguistic label, no emotional cues and uh, doesn't use any language to label anything, but the baby's body and visual attention is entrained by the adult's visual attention. We've done some intervention studies about this that are interesting, and I think during question and answer period might be the best time to talk about it because of the interest in, in time. Now I want to bridge to the school age uh, years and talk about stereotypes. There's many types of stereotypes in our culture that divide people. And Mary's program is all about bringing people together, recognizing empathy and emotions as the commonality across people. But as we know, culture tends to divide. There are labels and they affect young kids' development. And we were particularly interested to begin with in gender stereotypes. It's very interesting that uh, the last, one of the last people asking questions talked about gender. In American culture, and I'll talk about cross-cultural studies later, let me focus on America in a, in a second here for the beginning. There is a gender stereotype that's embodied in this picture, and what's embodied here is that boys do math and girls do reading. Now there are social psychology experiments with adults showing that in American culture, this stereotype is pervasive among adults, tested by explicit tests, 
report, questionnaires, and what's called an implicit association test, IAT, uh, implicitly if you give adults objects to sort and to show what their associations are, people think boys go with math, girls to go with reading. Our question is not about the adult mind, but about the child's mind, and given my research about imitation and how much they're implicitly absorbing information and becoming like the adults in the culture, we began to wonder what the effect of these cultural stereotypes had to do with children's development. In adults, it's also known um, that on the adult 18-year-old uh, SAT test for math, and every year for the past 20 years, males have significantly outperformed girls in mathematics. And that leads people, those findings lead people to wonder whether there's a difference in mathematical skills or ability between men and women. Larry Summers, the ex-president of Harvard, was famous for making a statement about females not having the same math aptitude as males do. That's why he's the ex-president of Harvard at the moment. But as a developmental psychologist, one is interested not in ruling out biology, we're not saying biology doesn't play a role, but I'm interested in the powerful effect of culture that the little girls and boys are bathed in every day and how that affects their mind. And one of the things is if you look around in uh, the media, you'll see stereotypes like this. These are pictures that one could commonly find, look quite natural to us, boys doing math, girls doing reading. The bottom picture is... Uh, quite striking. You know, there's a little girl looking dreamily out of, on a meadow from her book. You would tend not to have a little boy in this sort of picture in American culture. The point is that these images are bathing our little children. We saw how little babies as, as young as 18 months are affected by what they see and imitate it. We wonder whether they absorb these stereotypes. So we constructed a test and with elementary school kids between first and fifth grade that was adopting the adult implicit association test to look at implicit processing, not verbal report by the kids, but implicit processing with the young children. And the test is uh, roughly a categorization test. It's not done exactly like this, but by analogy, let me tell you what, it, what, it's, what it's like. It says if you have two buckets and you tell the children this is for girl things and this is for boy things, you do some warm up and you ask them to sort. This is for girls, this is for boys, and then you give them objects. And what we found is that as early as second grade, the kids had the world deeply stereotyped in terms of mathematics and reading. So if you, this is girls, this is boys, and you say, book, where does the book go? They look back and forth at second grade, and they put the book in the girl bucket. And then you give them something that says numbers, and they look back and forth, boy. Addition, boy. Multiplication, boy. Computer, boy. Graph, boy. Letter, girl. Reading, girl. It's astounding that as early as second grade, before they've learned their multiplication tables, the little girls are already saying, math is not for me. And we think that comes from the culture. So we've made these conceptual distinctions that were important in our research that help clarify things. The relationship between me or self and male can be called gender identity. The relation between male and math can be called a stereotype because it has to do with a gender category and a, an academic cat or any category like mathematics. It's a stereotype between a group and a, and a topic area. And the relation between self and math is a self-concept. In a lot of developmental psychology, those three things were in general mushed and confused and it led to messy results. But when we clarify these and develop these implicit association tests, that had to do with gender identity or cultural stereotypes, the things you see out there, or the relation to self, we got very clear results. And the developmental timeline that we obtained is something like this. Gender identity, we were able to show, many other people have shown it even earlier. I am a girl, let's say, develops quite early in infancy or preschool years. What we found in the new thing we found is that uh, the math gender stereotype, girls 
uh, don't do math was something that kids had absorbed from the culture as early as second grade and it was by about third grade that they developed something about a math self-concept in the case of girls, I don't do math. So we found this progression from gender identity to gender stereotypes to applying it to the self. And the developmental mechanism we think is going on is that gender identity anchors this. Little children recognize, I'm a girl. That is a label, I'm a girl, that they develop and understand quite early. Then they look out in, cult in the culture and in American culture, when they look out, what they see by media images and so forth is girls don't do mathematics. Girls don't do math. That's a stereotype. I'm not saying it's true. It's a stereotype that pervades their culture. And there is this phenomenon in social psychology called cognitive balance that we believe deeply affects the human mind even in early childhood. And given I'm a girl and girls don't do math, you then internalize that and apply it to the self to be consistent and the, the in, unconscious inference is I don't do math. So we don't think it's because of poor performance. In fact, girls are getting higher scores on, gra on mathematics at, in elementary school by grades than the boys are, but the cultural stereotype is eventually affecting the kid's self-concept. Now we're doing some cross-cultural work and Singapore is a very, very interesting case. My postdoc, Dario Savancek, finished a study in Singapore and we're just publishing a paper on this now. That is, we went to Singapore because Singaporean kids excel in math. The boys outperform the ma American males in math by a big margin. The girls outperform American girls on math, but there's a very, very interesting thing about gender differences. In, in Singapore, and that is the girls outperform the boys significantly. Now this tends to pull against the biological model because in America the boys do better than the girls. We think it's a natural thing. In Singapore the girls outperform the boys. That's why we went to Singapore. That's not true all over the world, but that's true in Singapore. So we went there and we are just finishing results now and I can just um, tell you from some analyses of the data, but it's sort of not, not published yet, from analysis of the data, what we're finding out is even though the girls excel in mathematics in Singapore, if you look at the girls who are, have a very strong math gender stereotype thinking that boys go with math, those are the poor performing girls in Singapore. So if you look at whichever of those girls have absorbed the stereotype, maybe from media, television, girls don't do math, they are doing poorly, the other ones are excelling, and the uh, Singaporean Ministry of Education is funding us now to do a cross-cultural intervention, not with more drill and kill on mathematics, because believe me, they do plenty of that in Singapore, but affecting and trying to change the kids' stereotypes because by changing the stereotypes, we can have the biggest bang for the buck in changing the kids' behavior. So we're going to be doing that intervention study with the National Institute of uh, Education in Singapore. I want it now to just do the, uh, some things about developmental social neuroscience very quickly. This is the last portion of the talk and the conclusions and wrap up. So this is about developmental brain science and the future. We've just published two papers this year looking at the, all the work that we do on imitation but bringing brain science to it. These are two papers published with Peter Marshall who's a neuroscientist at Temple University looking at mu rhythm changes. And the very interesting thing, it, it, which is mu rhythms are sort of related to mirror neuron uh, mechanisms. And what we did has babies with an EEG cap where we could measure neural changes when they performed an action and then the neural changes when they simply observe somebody else perform the same action. This is the same button push that you saw in my emotion task. And remarkably what we found is over central sites is where it's, where it's predicted to be found. The children not only had mu rhythm changes when they did this act, but they had the same mu rhythm changes if they were sitting there calmly with their hands on their lap and they sim watch, simply watch somebody else do a similar act. So the brain is recording whether somebody is acting like the self. We have a paper in press that was just thankfully accepted literally 48 hours ago, so I put in press on here. <laughs> um, and this was a, a paper that's going to come out in a journal that you all should be very interested in called Social Neuroscience. 
and we did a specific study where we had an adult being very sensitive in an interaction with the baby and matching what the baby's action was or mismatching what the baby's action was. And in this case, down is more, is a bigger change in mu rhythm. The baby's brain is very sensitive at 14 months when the adult is acting in synchrony with them, which again is something that you might expect from Roots of Empathy program. The baby's brain is tuned not only when they're being looked at, which we showed, but when somebody in the world is doing an action that's in concert with what they're doing. There's actually a brain rhythm change. Now the new magic machine that we have is a child uh, magnoencephalography, or MEG for short. This is a machine that we bought and installed with the help of generous uh, donors around Seattle. And the magic of this machine is it's the only one in the world where we'll be able to look at brain imaging of young babies while they're doing emotional tasks or engaged in social interaction. The way MEG works is it measures the magnetic field change outside the brain when there's neuronal firing inside the brain. That's a change in electrical current. And there's this helmet with 306 super quantum interference devices, squid devices, that measures magnetic field changes harmlessly outside the brain and sends the signals to a bank of computers where we can localize with millimeter accuracy and millisecond precision where and when there are changes in the brain happening when the baby is observing something. You cannot put a baby in an fMRI. For any of you who have had fMRIs, first of all, you have to stay rock solid. You have to lay on your back solid. And there's big clanking noises, and you can't do that with young kids. This is totally silent. Here's a 12-month-old baby, or 6-month-old baby in our MEG. This is what it looks like you can actually measure the brain changes happening in this baby's mind when they're watching something or hearing something. In this particular study, this baby is hearing native speech or a foreign speech for this baby, and we're measuring brain changes because we know where linguistic signals are processed in the brain, and this was a good first study to do. But we've demonstrated proof of concept now that we can completely non-invasively look at this with young children. And the magic that we're moving toward in the future is what about two brains, or what we're calling face-to-face -face neuroscience, not just the baby's brain, but interactive brain. And to do this, it is a huge technical challenge. It's something that we need to do with social neuroscience. We want to put it on the map, developmental uh, social neuroscience, where we do face-to-face -face neuroscience. We've hired bioengineers, uh, radiologists, physicists, and we're all around looking at babies' brains when they're in interaction. So this is a slide that we recently took and how we're looking at face-to-face -face interaction with babies, first in the world to do it. And we have the baby in this big, expensive $7 million MEG machine where we can get precise recording but we can have a person interact in social synchrony with a baby, interacting what they do, or not interacting what they do. Acting emotionally resonant in the way that Alan and Alan talk about, or not acting emotionally resonant, say a still face paradigm. So all the things that have been developed laboriously in developmental psychology in behavior to look at the baby's emotional responsivity we now want to do in this face-to-face -face neuroscience setup, and I think it's going to be a really big breakthrough and quite important because we'll be able to look for the first time about changes with the baby's brain online in real time when they are in the social interactions. And wouldn't you love to get a baby or a child from the Roots of Empathy program, a nine-year-old sitting in front of a young child after the Roots of Empathy program or in control groups to see whether the brain of that child when interacting with a baby or even interacting with an adult is different and has been changed by the program. If we can demonstrate that, it will be a very, very good cooperation and partnership. So we're interested in the brain science part and, there, and Mary and others are developing programs. So these are the five concluding things I want to say based on this science. There's implications for education and these stereotypes and these five topics. So very briefly, education around the world is not 
as American education is, natural pedagogy occurs around the world where there is what's called apprenticeship learning by Rogoff and others, where children are engaged in hands-on activity, they can observe and engage in joint visual attention and imitation to learn skills. Where they're looking at others, they're looking at peers and engage in imitation and joint attention. American classrooms, by contrast, look a lot like this, where people are doing sequestered problem solving. Kids are told don't copy. They're told not to look at each other's work. And it separates the kids. That's not what happens all around the world. I think one of the interesting things about Roots of Empathy program in the Green Blanket is the kids around the Green Blanket could observe the reactions of the others. And notice that kids learn from others, as we showed in the emotional eavesdropping, the kids are watching the interaction between two others and learning a lot from that. In American society, we often separate the kids in education. Second, about stereotypes, where do the stereotypes come from? As a scientist, we're interested in that. There are several places and, and interactions among them. Could be come from the parent culture, from peers, from school, or media. Here's an example of American media. I have a daughter, so these t-shirts really bother me. And these are t-shirts that young girls, unfortunately, need, are exposed to. I'll, I'm allergic to algebra, or I'm too pretty to do math. Now, knowing the effect of stereotypes, culture, how kids absorb messages, if that's what we put out there for them, we'd be blind to think we're not affecting them or affecting our children. So we want to explore where it's coming from. We also want to look, what's a missing one there? We want to look at individual differences because some females, of course, excel in mathematics. Despite the fact that it's a cultural stereotype that girls don't do math, obviously there are people, like my wife, who's very, very, very excellent in math. So we're interested in what helps some girls get through and excel in math despite the pressures from the culture not to do it, what extra psychological energy that might take, what, the, what uh, role model, what uh, aspect role models play and so forth. We're now turning to look at other stereotypes be besides for gender math stereotypes like racial stereotypes. I don't have to tell you there are deep racial stereotypes that divide us in American society and many societies. The division between us and them, my in-group and out-group, based on language, based on race, based on other factors. We can use the same methods that we've developed with child IAT and other ones to look at math gender stereotypes, to look at racial stereotypes, stereotypes about heavy people or not, short people or not. Kids and culture deeply stereotype each other, and that divides us, as Mary writes about. I think if we can look at, intervent at ways of measuring the origins of stereotypes in young kids and then intervention programs, uh, it will be very, very helpful. We are also interested in looking at stereotypes and brain imaging by having the kids in a brain imaging device when we expose them to different stereotypes. Intervention programs, we are now doing that in um, Singapore. As I said, the Singaporean government has asked us to come to try to do some interventions where we can talk about stereotypes not applying to the self, even though other people in society hold them. And maybe during question and answer, we can talk about how some of the techniques that have been developed in the Roots of Empathy program might be applied to breaking down stereotypes with the goal of boosting academic performance. This isn't about empathy training, even though I understand that the Roots of Empathy program does change academic performance. What I'm saying is that some of the techniques that have been developed may be able to go to attack stereotypes directly and that that could change kids' behavior, increase school performance directly, and help the, for the acceptance of the program even more broadly. In the American situation, we're faced with this. We want to try to change it to this. I'm a girl. Girls do do mathematics. Therefore, I do math. And intervention programs will get at that. So the last two slides then are, we want to raise awareness about these connections between early learning, role models, the absorption of social information, and how 
you see in infancy transfers to schools and the stereotypes we see in the culture. We wrote an article about connecting those things in science that is about a, we called it a new science of learning that takes a very highly interdisciplinary approach, linking psychology, neuroscience, education, and some things about computer science. And we're also, last slide, working on raising awareness for the public, as I know all of you are, and it's partly what the Roots program of bringing Roots around the world is. We need to bring the science to the public to change awareness about what we're all finding about the power of social-emotional learning and uh, culture on kids' development. At the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences, we were privileged to participate in something in New York City in September 2011 called Education Nation. Uh, it brought together many, many educators, and Pat Cool and I gave a address about early uh, learning and how that affects schools. It was on the, on the NBC website, this, um, this uh, program, and by NBC's uh, calculation, there were 54 million hits on the website that had to do with spreading the word about transforming, transforming early education and how these findings on child development, as had been, asked, had been asked by some about teacher education, how the new findings on child development and brain science can be used to transform education. There's a deep hunger about how the science can be used to change society. I know The Roots is taking this program around the world. I think many developmental psychologists feel that same responsibility. We think that the findings on developmental social neuroscience are going to be a big breakthrough. If we can show children interacting with adults and show the brain on love, and that love does build brains, as Mary shows, and we have hard neuroscience, neuroscience evidence about it, we think it will be one component that will be important to change things. So we're devoting a lot of time to that. Thank you.